the event of oil and chemical spills. Um, and uh, when we're not responding to a spill, we work on developing our tools. So I've been using Python for, I think, 15 years now. I just thought about it, so it's been a while. Uh, and I'm going to talk about where we're at with our um, next generation oil spill model. Uh, where are we? Okay. Um, so talking a little bit about GNOME. This is actually, I'm getting this really weird view on my screen where I can't actually read my own slides. Um, but. Uh, Essentially, there's, there's way too much to talk about. I was putting this talk together, and I'm kind of putting in things, and all of a sudden, I realize I've got like 60 slides and 20 minutes to talk about it. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of do a little bit of grab bag talking about the Python API we've developed for this model and also some of the issues uh, we face with coding and wrapping C++ code and whatnot. And I'm not even going to mention the algorithms. Um, so just a little tiny bit of background. Uh, the NOAA's Emergency Response Division is responsible for providing 24-7 support in the oil, oil and chemical spills. Um, and one of the key things is that we get called whenever we happen to get called, and we've got to give answers uh, very quickly, and the we don't know is never an acceptable answer. Um, so we develop tools that really help us answer questions uh, quickly. Um, so we sort of think about how we answer questions about spills in this little framework. Uh, what happened? Where will it go? Who does it hit? How does it hurt? And the where will it go part is what I personally do most of my work on, and that's what our uh, model I'm talking about today is about. Where is the oil going to go? Um, so an oil spill model has to be very quick to initialize. Uh, we've got to get answers within hours. It's also got to run quick. It has to be very easy to calibrate. Uh, we cover a really wide range of scales. Most of the time we're dealing with, you know, a couple thousand gallons spill in a small bay, and then every once in a while we'll get hit with the Deepwater Horizon spill and be looking at, you know, the entire Gulf of Mexico or indeed, you know, considering is it going to go out to the Gulf Stream and hit the North Atlantic. So we have to cover this huge range of scales. Um, and we need to be able to make use of whatever data or model results are out there, you know, whether it's HF radar or unstructured grids or structured grids or whatever. Um, and all this leads to using particle tracking. It's a really good way to deal with the multiple scales. Um, and we need a really flexible framework. Uh, so GNOME 1 has been our bread and butter tool for, well, let's see. I guess it, it, we first started writing that probably about 16 years ago. Um, it's written in C++. It's a desktop graphical user interface. Um, and the code between the graphical interface and the computational code is all kind of tightly intertwined. Um, and it primarily covers just the transport side of the equation. We don't really uh, model oil weathering in that tool. And it has kind of a limited batch processing mode, but, it, but it's limited. It doesn't have a full scripting language. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so the goals for GNOME 2 are to provide a fully flexible, powerful scripting interface. And so Python is the obvious choice for that. Um, and we also really want it to be a lot easier to add new features. We want to be able to plug in new what we call movers, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, new different types of maps, different types of elements. Uh, a lot of particle tracking models are used for things like larval transport, hab transport. Um, GNOME's been used for those things as well. Um, and we want it to be easier to test and maintain. Uh, and we're going to try to really move towards an open source development model. I actually just pushed the code up to GitHub right before this meeting, although I think it got stalled out at 34%, so might have to wait till tomorrow for that. Um, so the key features are it's a particle, particle tracking model. We're looking at where particles go. We call them Lagrangian elements, but it's the same thing. Um, and essentially, we're looking at linear superposition of different physical processes. So each physical process we're trying to model, we simply model that independently and we add it all up at the end. Um, so the key pieces in this are what we call movers. Anything that moves a particle is a mover. So that could be wind, it could be currents, um, it could be our random diffusion, um, it could be droplet buoyancy, moving particles uh, vertically, or if you've got some kind of, say, fish larval behavior you want to model, it would just be another mover as far as gnome is concerned. Um, and then we have spills. And a spill is essentially just a source of particles. Um, so 
That could be a point source. We have in our graphical interface a kind of spray can tool where you basically just sort of spray in where the particles are based on observations. Or if you know where particles are for some reason, you can stick them in. Or like a plume model would be a source of particles for a 3D spill. Um, and uh, so it's a source of when and where particles are released and what their properties are when they're released. Um, and then we have maps. So a map is something that defines the shoreline and or the bathymetry for 3D models and handles the logic of how the particles or elements interact uh, with the shoreline or with the bottom. Um, so putting all these pieces together in the, the GNOME sort of main loop, um, so we start out by initializing the model. We basically go through each spill and each mover until it to initialize itself. And then in each time step, we just loop through the movers and say, okay, you move your, do your thing. Uh, then we go to the maps and the maps handle uh, beaching or refloating elements or figuring out if stuff's gone off the map or out of your domain. And then we write the output. Repeat, lather, rinse, repeat. Um, now we're also building a web interface to the new GNOME model. Another reason why having Python drive it has been really helpful. Um, we're going to be having it running in the NOAA server with all sort of preset up for standard locations. Uh, these are similar to what we currently call location files, if any of you have seen those. Um, and these are really used for intuition building and educational purposes. For operational modeling, you really need to kind of tweak and control it more. Um, and you'll be able to kind of get a setup, get it set up the way you want, download, save that, reload that up. Um, but now that we're kind of opening up the code, you also could run your own server if you want. So if you want to have a web interface to a spill model for your location, and maybe it's driven by your own hydro model, uh, you'll be able to do that. And this is just a quick screenshot of what it looks like in its current version. Um, I don't have time to really talk about the architecture of the web application, but it's, it's kind of pretty cool stuff using a lot of the kind of newer web development techniques. Um, so the real kind of goal to PyGNOME, our uh, new sort of uh, Python library for driving this model, is it's fully Python scriptable. You can add your own pieces, as I mentioned. Um, and you can write those pieces in Python if you want, or if you want to write them in Fortran or C or something that you can call from Python, you can do that too. Um, and it was really important that we could make use of our legacy C++ code. Uh, we've been building that up for 15 years. It's, uh, it's pretty robust. We know it works, does a lot of stuff. Didn't want to rewrite all that. Um, so the kind of core structure is the model itself is written in Python. And then we're trying to provide a clean API to these components I talked about, in, to, in the movers, maps, spills, um, and outputters, different ways to output data. Um, I also mentioned the environment. Um, so we're trying to do is separate a little bit out. So like a win time series is sort of considered an environment uh, variable so that other um, different movers might actually need the same wind series to drive those things. In our case, we use the wind to actually push things that are floating along the surface directly. Um, and we also might use the wind to drive, uh, say, a wind-driven current in the shallow estuary. And we want those tied to the same wind. Um, so core to all this is what we call the spill container. And this is really our class that holds all the elements. Um, in the original model, basically each element was recommended uh, was represented by a large C struct. Uh, so all the data that needed to be associated with an element was just one field in this struct. And what we ended up with is this sort of huge struct. Um, and every time we had some sort of new application and we wanted to think about uh, some new way these particles might move, we found, oh, there's some more data we add. And we make this struct bigger. And this starts getting passed around the code. Um, so we decided that that was really getting a bit unwieldy. Uh, and so a new approach, we wanted to be more memory efficient. A given mover might just need to know the positions of the particles, and it doesn't need to know the particle's density. It doesn't need to know what it's the different, um, you know, petroleum compound components it has or whatever else. Um, so we wanted a way to not be pushing all that extra data around. Um, since these days you're often waiting for memory to push in and out of your processor more than you're waiting for the computation. Um, and we also want it to be dynamic, so you could just add new, uh, new data associated with your particles on the fly at runtime. So if you've, you're suddenly saying, oh, I want to model larva transport, and I need this other little piece of information associated with a particle, you can just stick it in there. Um, uh, so that we're basically implementing this with, it's just a dictionary of NumPy arrays. So you can ask for a particular array by its name, and you get this nice NumPy array with your stuff. Um, and uh, the, the spill container itself manages and makes sure that these arrays are all the same size, one uh, element for each particle. And when you're adding and removing particles, it manages all that kind of stuff for you. 
And this is basically the core class that gets passed around to all the other objects that then have to uh, interact with these particles. So just showing a code a little bit, this is the basic API of the spill container. Um, so we have the get item overloaded, so you can just index by the name of your data array that you want, and you get that back. You know, you can figure out how many elements it has. Um, almost everything in the model has a rewind method, which basically just says go reset yourself to your initial state. Um, and then there's the release elements method, which then calls the associated spills that are associated with this, and when each spill can then create new particles as needed. Um, so that brings us to the mover API, which is really the core piece. If you want to extend this model and do something new with it, this is what you need to know. Uh, so, you know, it's got a basic initialization. Uh, movers can be on and off at any given moment. Uh, and then we have active start and active stop. Uh, so a particular mover or physical process that acts might begin at some point in time and end at another point in time, and that can be handled that way. Uh, we have this little class I created called the infinite date time to represent sort of all time from the beginning and the end. So you can set this up and you don't have to know what time the person is going to be running the model and just say, I want this turned on all the time. Um, and then every mover has a prepare for model run method, which might do nothing, but it might have to do something to initialize itself. Go and, you know, load data from an open DAP server or something. Uh, then there's prepare for model step. Um, and that gets the spill container object so that if there's some kind of information you need to initialize in your particles, you can do it there. And you know the time step and the model time, so you can, the mover can prepare itself. And again, that would be a really good time, for instance, to go and load the next time step from your NetCDF file. Um, and then there's a model step is done method, so if there's something you need to do to kind of clean up stuff at the end of each model step, you can do it there. Um, and then here's the key one, get move. This is where you actually do the real work. And again, you get your spill container, so you can grab the particle's positions or any of its physical properties you need to figure out how to move it. And again, you know the time step um, and the model time at that point. Um, we pass the time step in each time because we're anticipating that we might want to have a variable time step in the model at some point. Currently, it's always the same, uh, but we wanted to try to decouple that so that um, that would be an option. And then what get move actually returns is the delta. So you're, you know the particle's position, and what you return is how much has this particle moved? Um, and, uh, and that's actually, the, it's the delta in latitude longitude coordinates. And we do everything in latitude longitude coordinates because each individual mover might have a native projection that, um, that is different. Um, so our kind of common lingua franca is the lat long itself. Um, and then what we actually do is save up each delta independently and then add it all together so that each mover gets the initial position of the particle that hasn't been messed with yet by the previous movers. So that way it doesn't matter which mover happens to run first. Um, now all of a sudden, I'm hitting a button and nothing's changing. That's weird. There we go. Very strange. Did I miss one? I did. Missed a couple. Okay. So how do you actually write a mover? So here's an example of our, so essentially I calling it the simple mover. It's sample code for how to write a mover. So again, it needs an initialization. Um, this would represent, say, a steady uniform current. Same speed and direction everywhere for all time. Um, so all it needs to get passed in is a velocity. Uh, and then we've got this little keyword args. Uh, <clears throat> argument that gets passed on uh, to the superclass mover. So any other arguments just pass on through. Um, and then in this case, I'm just taking the input UVW velocities and uh, converting them into a NumPy array of the right type. Um, and then you have to define a get move. So there are all those other methods. In this case, it's so simple, it doesn't need the initialization or anything. So all we have to do is write a get move. So in this case, Again, the get move gets past the spill or spill container and the time step and the model time. So I can go through and say, oh, all right, I need to know the positions of the particles. I need to know their status code. Status code is a little flag saying whether the particle is um, on land or whether it's in the water or whether it's been pushed off the map or something like that. Um, if I can't get those attributes out of uh, my spill container, it raises an exception. That should never happen, but it's sort of nice to get a meaningful message at the right time if you've done something wrong. Um, 
And then I take a quick look at the status code and grab, get a little Boolean mask for all the particles that are in the water. Um, and then I can compute the move. Um, and computing the move is pretty simple. I check if this current mover is active and it's turned on. Uh, the difference is that active is looking at the start and start times for this particular mover, and on is a sort of global, you can just turn it on and off. Um, so if it's both active and on, then I just multiply the velocity times the time step. That's how much it moves. And then remember that delta gets returned in lat long coordinates. So now I have to convert meters to lat long, and we have a little projection class that does that for you. And you return that. So it's that simple to kind of write a new mover. I mean, a mover that does anything interesting is going to have a whole lot more code in there. But where you have to interact with GNOME is um, about as simple as that. Um, <clears throat> so another thing you might want to do is have a new way to add elements to the model. So this is the API for a spill. So a spill, again, has an initialization. Again, it has an on-off flag. Um, you have to have some kind of rewind method, how to reset yourself. And then you need a release elements method. And the release elements is going to get the current time, the time step. Um, and that little array types. Um, attribute is saying these are the types of arrays that we actually need you to create as you create new particles. Um, and that comes from the spill container and it's um, each of the movers has different kinds of data it needs to do its thing. And so the spill container is aware of that and tells the spill to create these arrays. That's how you make a new spill. Um, and then there's a map API. And the map is what checks again for these particles interaction uh, with the shoreline or bottom or boundary. Um, and so a map has to have a few basic features. You want to know what allowable spill position is a function that lets you know whether you can set a spill in a particular location. Usually that's whether it's like on land or in water, but you could also have other regions that you want to make not allowable because you know you haven't modeled that region well. Um, and then you need a beach elements method. And the beach elements method then figures out which particles have hit land, which have not, and beaches them if they have. Um, it also looks at whether stuff has gone off the map and out of your domain and all that kind of stuff. And what those, what those um, <clears throat> methods end up doing is manipulating the flags that are in that spill container. And then you have a refloat elements. So another thing we do in our model is uh, particles can optionally be refloated from the shoreline uh, based on some kind of criteria. And that gets called at some point during that loop. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about code. Uh, one of the neat things we kind of came up with is how are we going to serialize all this? One thing people do with GNOME is they spend a lot of time doing this whole kind of setup. They maybe even run it once and then they want to pause and save all that and be able to load it up again. Um, so in some sense it would be easy enough to just kind of pickle everything. Um, and that's actually what GNOME, GNOME 1 more or less does in the C++ sense. It does just a binary dump of all the objects and they can be reloaded. And that turns out to, first of all, be very fragile because you go and change your code and all of a sudden you can't reload any of your previous setups. Um, and also, no other application, no other human being can do anything with that saved data. So we decided we wanted to save it in a way that was kind of human readable and, and manipulatable. Um, <clears throat> so another goal was, you know, we're building this web application also and we're actually ending up building that essentially as a JSON service. So we're going to need to communicate um, about all these objects and how they're configured uh, with the web app. Um, and that involves a lot of checking validity of, of data and stuff like that. Um, so we went with JSON. Uh, we wanted to use JSON on the web anyway, so let's just use that as our serialization format across, across the board. Um, and then we also used the colander library, uh, which we had to monkey patch a little to get it to read and write JSON. Um, but it's a library that's really designed for web applications, but it does a whole data validation step for you. Um, so it's kind of cool. You can say this object is supposed to have these fields, and, they, and you, can, you can do custom stuff. But it's a floating point number that's got to be greater than zero, and all that kind of stuff can be set in there. And that all gets validated when the JSON gets read. Um, so a, in order to implement this, what we've got is a mix-in class, the serializable mix-in class. Um, so you add that, you subclass your object from serializable, um, and then you tell it a little about what fields you want to mess around with. Um, so you set which fields can be updated, and this is mostly used for the web app, that a user just may change some parameters of something. Those are the things that can be updated. Um, and then ones that get set only when you're creating uh, a new one, and uh, stuff that can be read back out. Um, and so, 
this essentially is your kind of core state variables. You've defined all that. And then once you set this up like this, now your object is serializable and can be sort of brought into the rest of the model and saved out. Um, so a little example of how it works is you can define the new from dict uh, method. And this is basically you get a dictionary of all those parameters that were set and saved in JSON. And um, what Colander actually does is take the JSON and convert it into a Python dictionary. Um, so you have to write a method that you can create your stuff. Um, the default one, the base implementation actually, is just pass that dict in as keyword arguments. Um, so in, a, in the basic case, in fact, what you want, all you need to do to save your um, and restore your object is all your initial stuff that was set. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, and, but you might want to overwrite it. Here's some examples there. Um, so in this case, we need to actually pull the wind object out. And that's not something you usually initialize with. Um, so <laughs> this little example of a serialization um, of a model setup. So you've got the model itself. It has a map. It has a renderer. It has a wind mover. It's got a random mover. Um, it's got what we call a cat's shio mover, which is a current scaled by uh, tidal currents. Um, and so all that stuff gets saved, and uh, each of these .txt files is actually JSON. And those big, ugly string of letters and numbers there actually is a uh, UUID, so it's a unique ID for that object. And that way, when the stuff gets saved and loaded up again, they can all refer to each other by what's known to be a unique um, model. Um, but if you also look towards the bottom here, the .cur file, the .bna file, those are the standard data files we load a lot of this information from. So you can actually go in there and look and see what the model was built from and maybe replace the current file, replace the wind data. Um, if this stuff is loaded from NetCDF, it would be there too. How am I doing on time? I'm gonna think I'm about out, am I? I'm supposed to be watching my own time, I guess. Um, I want to just quickly say we did a lot of heavy use of Cython. I've got some slides here about some of that complexity, which I'm going to skip through because I think I'm out of time. Um, but I want to make a little note. I'm going to mirror what uh, Rich just said, a note about standards. Uh, when we're not sharing code, let's at least share data and results. Um, this has made it really like the, the NetCDFCF standard has done wonders for our ability to go and ingest um, other people's models, which we really need to do. Um, so I'd really like to see some more work done on the unstructured grid standard. Uh, so hopefully over the next couple days, we'll do a little work on a Pi U grid uh, class. Um, also, there's been some discussion, but no real formal process for a NetCDF standard for particle tracking model output. So that's another thing. Talk to me if you want to write files uh, with your particle tracking model, and we can try to converge on something. Quickly mention the GNOME development team. Uh, Caitlin O'Connor has been the primary GNOME developer for the last 14 years. Uh, so she deserves a lot of credit here. And all of a sudden, we're throwing in, OK, you've been doing C++ all this time. And now we want you to learn Python and Cython and you know, JavaScript. And she's been great. Uh, Jasmine Sandu did all that serialization stuff. Um, it's really been pretty wonderful. Um, James Michaela has actually managed to do our 64-bit port. That's nice. Uh, Amy McFadden and Bra Brian Zelenke are oceanographers that work in our group and are also kind of getting into the code a little bit, which is really nice. Uh, and Andrew Brookins wrote uh, almost the entire uh, web app, and he's in parentheses because he's unfortunately just left us and moved on to greener pastures. Um, I just wanted to credit that. So partner with us. Uh, we're happy to have you work with our code. Just use it, contribute to it, whatever. Uh, that's the GitHub link, which hopefully will be uh, actually have real code in it soon enough. And thank you very much. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'm going to hold off on questions, and, uh, but we can talk at the end of the session. <laughs>